The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So what I'm going to do today is I want to talk about what the heck this course is. What is microeconomics? What are you going to be learning in this course? Uh, and just sort of set us up for the semester. OK, so basically, microeconomics is all about scarcity. It's all about how individuals and firms make decisions given that we live in a world of scarcity. Scarcity is key because basically what we're going to learn about this semester in various shapes and forms is a lot of different types of constrained optimization. We're going to learn a lot about different ways that individuals make choices in a world of scarcity. Okay? That is, this course is going to be about trade-offs. Given scarce resources, how do individuals and firms trade off different alternatives to make themselves as well off as possible? That's why economics is called the dismal science. Okay, economics is called the dismal science because we are not about everyone have everything. We're always people who say, no, you can't have everything. You have to make a trade off. Okay, you have to give up x to get y. And that's why people don't like us. Okay, because that's what we're called the dismal science, because we're always pointing out the trade offs that people face. Now, some of them may call it dismal, but I call it fun. Um, and that may be because of my MIT training. Uh, as I said, I was an undergraduate here. Um, in fact, MIT is the perfect place to teach microeconomics because this whole institute is about engineering solutions, which are really ultimately about constrained optimization. Indeed, there's, what's the best example in the world we have of this is the 270 contest. Right? You're given a set of pile of junk. You've got to build something that does something else. That's an exercise of constrained optimization. All engineering is really constrained optimization. How do you take the resources you're given and do the best job building something? And that's really uh, what microeconomics is. Uh, just like 270 is not a dismal contest, microeconomics is not, to me, a dismal science. You can think of it, think of this course like 270, but instead of building robots, we're running people's lives. Okay? That's kind of the way I like to think about this course. Instead of trying to decide how we can build some, move a ping pong ball across a table, we're trying to decide how people make the decisions to consume and firms make the decisions to produce. That's basically what's going to go on in this class. Okay? And that's why basically modern microeconomics was founded at MIT in the 1950s by Paul Samuelson. The father of modern, uh, the, the father of modern economics was a professor here, and he basically founded the field. He basically introduced mathematics to economics. Uh, and through teaching this course, 1401, you know, 50, 60 years ago, actually developed the field that we now study. Now, um, what we're going to do in this class is focus on two types of actors in the economy, consumers and producers. Consumers and producers, OK? And we are going to build models of how consumers and producers behave. Now, technically, a model is going to be a description of any relationship between two or more economic variables. Okay? That's a model, a description of any relationship between two or more economic variables. The trick with economics, and the reason many of you will be frustrated during the semester, is, unlike is that unlike modeling the relationship between, say, energy and mass, these models are never precise. They are never pr accurate to the 10th decimal. Okay? Um, this is not a precise scientific uh, relationship we'll be modeling. We'll be making a number of simplifying assumptions that allow us to capture the main tendencies in the data, that allow us to capture the main insights into how individuals make consumption decisions and how firms make production decisions. But it's not going to be as clean and precise as the kind of proofs you're going to be doing in some of your other classes uh, in freshman and, and sophomore year. Okay? So basically, um, we have a trade-off with these simplifying assumptions. On the one hand, uh, obviously we want a model that can explain reality as much as possible. Uh, if a model can't explain reality, it's not useful. On the other hand, we need a model that's tractable, a model that I can teach you uh, in a lecture or less. Okay? Um, and basically, uh, what we do um, is we make some, a lot of simplifying assumptions in this class to make those models work. And yet, what we'll find is, despite these assumptions, we'll come up with incredibly powerful predictions of how consumers and producers uh, behave. So the consumers, what we're going to do is we're going to say the consumers 
are constrained by their limited wealth, or what we'll call their budget constraint. And subject to that constraint, they choose the set of goods that makes them as well off as possible. Okay? It's what we're going to call utility maximization. We'll say the consumers maximize their utility. Consumers are going to maximize utility subject to a budget constraint. That's going to be what we're going to, what we're going to develop the consumer decision. They're going to have some utility function, which is going to be a model of their preferences. Okay. So I'm going to propose to take everything you love in life and write it down as a U function. Okay. Then I'm going to take all the resources at your disposal, write them down as a budget constraint, and then I just do constraint maximization to solve for how you make decisions. Firms, on the other hand, are going to maximize profits. Highest profits. Firms are going to maximize profits. Their goal is to make as much profit as possible, to earn as much money as possible. Okay? However, that's going to be subject to both the demands of consumers. This is going to be, the, we get to firms, it's a lot harder. Subject to both consumer demand and input costs. So firms have to consider. Consumers have to consider, look, what does stuff cost? What do I like? I'll make my decision. Firms is a little more complicated. They've got to consider what do consumers want and how do I make what they want. So they've got to consider both, what the, both the output side, what are consumers going to want me to make, and what's it going to cost me to produce that good, and how do I combine those to make the most profits. Okay? So from these assumptions, we will be able to answer um, the three fundamental questions of microeconomics. Okay? The three fundamental questions of microeconomics will be what goods and services should be produced? What goods and services should be produced? How to produce those goods and services? And who gets the goods and services? What goods and services get produced, how to produce those goods and services, and who gets them. And what's amazing, we'll learn in this course, is that all three of these questions, the three fundamental questions that drive our entire economy, are all solved through the role of one key state variable, which is prices. Prices in the economy will resolve all of these problems. Okay. Consumers and firms will interact in a market. They'll interact in a marketplace. And out of that marketplace will emerge a set of prices in a way we'll describe. And those prices will allow firms and consumers to make the relevant decisions. Okay. So let me just give you one. And we're going to do all this rigorously throughout the semester. Let me just start with one casual example. Okay. Let's think about the development of the iPod. Okay, let's cast our main minds way back, low way back to the development of the iPod. Okay, now when the iPod, when when firm, when Apple was thinking about making the iPod, they had to ask, would consumers want this? So consumers had to decide, given their limited resources, given the fact that they were buying a certain set of things, would they be willing to forsake some things they were already doing to spend the money on the iPod? Okay, it was a non-trivial amount of money. Would they be willing to forsake things they're already doing okay, to spend them on the iPod? And clearly they were. Clearly consumers were willing to spend money, to spend a lot of money uh, to get an iPod. They were originally, what, 300 bucks back you know, when 300 bucks meant something. Okay, so basically, um, so what the firm will do is they'll say, okay, we get, we get a signal from the consumer that they're, that they're willing to pay money to get the iPod. They're willing to pay a high price to get the iPod. Now, the firm will say, well, should we make iPods? Well, that will depend on what it costs to make them. So we have to, we have to then assess what, is the, uh, what are the inputs that we'll need to make an iPod. Well, to do that, we have to look at the prices of the various inputs that we'll need, of the chip and the, and the metal and all the other stuff that goes into the iPod. Okay. So they can shop across different countries for different kinds of chips. They can look at different kinds of monitors, et cetera. But once again, what they'll do is they'll shop, they'll use the prices 
of those different inputs to decide how to produce the iPod. So whether to produce the iPod will depend on the price people are willing to pay for it. How to make the iPod will depend on the prices that firms have to pay for the chip and the casing and all the other things that go into the iPod. Okay? And then finally, who's going to get the iPod? Well, they're going to make a certain amount. What decide who gets them? Well, the person who gets them is the people who are willing to pay the price that Apple decides to charge. Some people are willing to pay that price. They're going to get an iPod. Some people are not willing to pay that price. They will not get an iPod. So the price in the market will ultimately decide who gets the iPod as well. Okay? So basically, prices will determine what gets produced, how it's produced, and who gets the goods that are produced. Okay? Of course, this is a very, very simplified example, as you can already tell. There are lots of cases where prices don't decide these things. So my favorite example is the fact that there are lines for hours to get tickets to see a Lady Gaga concert. Okay? Now, what would it, what can it, if, if it's really true that prices determine everything, we shouldn't see any lines. It should just be that those who are willing to pay the most to see Lady Gaga should, uh, those who want to see the, uh, see the most to get, to get a Lady Gaga should get the tickets. Those who aren't willing to pay it shouldn't get the tickets. Why should there be a line? Not to mention the fact that people shouldn't be willing to pay anything, but that's a different issue. That's a taste issue. We'll come to taste later. Okay? So basically, Clearly, this is not working perfectly. If the world worked in the way I just described, then what should happen is there should be essentially an auction, and whoever's willing to pay the most for Lady Gaga tickets would get them, and whoever's not willing to pay wouldn't, and it wouldn't involve any waiting in line or, 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 or other things. Now, what's very interesting is we've actually seen an evolution from my youth to your youth towards the economic model. When I was a kid, if you wanted, so then it was cars tickets, OK, to date myself, OK? You had to go and camp out at 3 in the morning outside the, the, outside the store where they're selling them to get the tickets. Now, of course, you don't do that anymore. Now you go on StubHub or Ticketmaster or, or, or these other secondary sellers, and there, there are prices that determine it. So increasingly, use, how many people actually ask a question? How many people have waited online to get a concert ticket? OK, that's amazing. So when I, if I asked this question 30 years ago, 90% of the hands would have gone up. Okay, so what that means is the price mechanism has started to be used, to, has replaced the line mechanism as, uh, as a way to allocate those tickets, and we see prices working. That wasn't true. There, weren't, there wasn't StubHub. These weren't these second, secondary ticket sellers 30 years ago. You had to wait online to get the tickets. Now, um, so that's basically sort of an overview about sort of an example of how we think about the role of prices. Now, let me draw a couple of important distinctions terms I'm going to use this semester that I want you to be comfortable with. Okay? The first distinction I want to draw is between theoretical versus empirical economics. Theoretical versus empirical economics. Okay. Theoretical economics is the process of building models to explain the world. Okay? Empirical economics is the process of testing those models to see how good a job they do in explaining the world. Okay? We could all make up a model. Okay? Anybody who has math skills could make up a model, but it doesn't do any good unless it, uh, it doesn't do any good unless it's actually doing something to explain the world. And so basically uh, what we want to do, the goal of theoretical economics is essentially to build a model that has some testable predictions. To build a model that says, look, here's my simplified model of how consumers decide whether or not to uh, buy an iPod. Okay? I have a model of that that I've built theoretically. Well, that has some testable predictions. And the role of empirical economics is to gather the data and go and test them using statistical methods. Um, Specifically, typically regression analysis of the kind you learn about in, in advanced statistics. Okay? So basically, um, what we're going to do is we're going to mostly, 95% of this course will be about theoretical economics this semester. It'll be about understanding how economists develop the models to model how consumers and firms behave. But I will try to talk somewhat about empirical economics 
and what data we can bring to bear to understand whether or not these models um, uh, explain the world. Okay? The other distinction that's very important is positive versus normative economics. Positive versus normative economics. Okay? And this is the distinction between the way things are, which is positive economics, and the way things should be, which is normative economics. The distinction between the way things are and the way things should be. Okay? So let's consider a great example of microeconomics at work, which is auctions on eBay. Okay? Auctions on eBay, economists love studying auctions on eBay because it's a textbook example of what we call a perfectly competitive market, which is what we'll focus on this semester. A perfectly competitive market. Okay? And by that we mean that basically, uh, by that we mean that producers in this market offer up their good to a wide range of consumers. Okay? A number of producers offer up their good to a wide range of consumers. Okay? And the consumers bid up the price until the person with the highest value for the good gets it. So price serves exactly the signal it should in allocating goods. Okay? So really, eBay is really sort of about this third thing of who gets the good. Okay? I offer my, you know, uh, my, uh, my alarm clock or whatever on eBay. Okay? And then people bid on that. And whoever values that the most, that rare John Gruber alarm clock the most, they get it. Okay? So it's a perfect textbook example. Okay? And basically, because in, on eBay, the price is used, or now with also StubHub and concert tickets, the price is used to allocate the good to the person who wants it the most. Okay? Now, a recent example of an auction on eBay got a lot of attention, not so recent anymore, a couple years ago. Someone tried to auction their kidney on eBay. Okay? Someone offered their kidney for auction on eBay. They said, I have two kidneys, I only need one. So I'm going to auction my kidney. You pay for me to fly to wherever you need my kidney and the operation. They take it, I'm going to give it to you, and, and, and that's the way it goes. Um, so what happened? Well, this person offered their kidney, and they said the starting price will be 25000 They didn't do a buy it now. They said the starting price will be 25000 and the bidding was, was And the bidding went on. The price got to $5 million before eBay shut it down. eBay shut the auction down. And eBay said, no, in fact, uh, you can't do this. Now, there's two questions here. The first is, why did the price of the kidney go so high? That's the positive question. The positive question is, why did the price of the kidney on eBay uh, get so high? And here, we'll talk, and you'll learn more starting Friday, about the twin forces of supply and demand. The twin forces that drive the economy of supply and demand. And you'll talk more vigorously about these on, um, on Friday. Basically, they're what they sound like. Demand is how much something wants. someone wants something. Supply is how much of it there is to have. And the intuition here is unsurprising. Okay? The, more that, um, uh, the more that there's demand for a good, the higher will be the upward pressure on prices. The more people want a good, the higher prices will go. And the less supply there is of a good, also the higher prices will go. So if everybody wants something, but it's common, the price will be low. And if no one wants something, but it's, but it's uncommon, the price will still be low, and vice versa. In fact, the best sort of de de development of the modern supply-demand framework was from Adam Smith, uh, the sort of so-called first economist who wrote The Wealth of Nations, 1776, which is sort of viewed as the kind of first e serious book about economics. And he posed what he called the water-diamond paradox. What Smith said in that book is, look, it's clear water is the most important thing in life. We can't live without water. And diamonds are completely irrelevant to life. Diamond, you can live plenty fine without a diamond. And yet the price of diamonds is astronomical and water is free. How can this be? How can it be that water, which is so much, more, so much of a fundamental building block of our life, is so much cheaper than diamonds, which are not? And the answer, of course, is the first, that so far you've only considered demand and not supply. Yes, it's true the demand for water is much higher than the demand for diamonds, but the supply is even larger. So that basically, yes, it's true that while, the, while water should be worth more, in fact, in the end, the price of water is much lower 
because the twin forces of demand and supply. The demand is higher, but the supply is much higher. So the price ends up lower. And that was his diamond water paradox. Okay? Well, in this case, it's a similar thing. What's the demand? What's going to determine the demand for a kidney? Well, the term the demand for a kidney is going to be the fact that you die without it. Okay? If you have no kidneys, you're having kidney failure, okay, you'll die without it. So basically, we'll determine as people will be willing to spend all their wealth, as much money as they can have, to get a kidney. Okay? So the demand will be quite high. The supply will be quite low. Sadly, not many people are willing to be organ donors. More relevantly, a lot of people aren't in good situations to be organ donors. Okay? As a result, the supply is much lower than the demand. So you have a situation with a high demand, a low supply, and the price went through the roof. That's the positive analysis. Okay? So we can understand pretty intuitively. We don't need this course to understand why the price went up. Okay? It's just the twin powers of demand and supply. But what about the normative question, which is should this sale be allowed? Uh, ha should eBay have allowed this sale to happen? eBay at $5 million cut it off and then passed the rule saying you can't auction your body parts on eBay. Okay? Should they have done that? That's the normative question. That's where economics gets really interesting, which is, you know, you know, you're all smart enough to figure out why the price went up. But this is where it gets interesting is should um, people have been able to auction their uh, kidney on eBay? On the one hand, Many, many people in this country die for want of a body part. Okay? Thousands to hundreds of thousands of people die every year waiting for a transplant. Okay? If someone's incredibly rich and they want a body part, which to me is surplus, because I have two kidneys, why shouldn't they be allowed to buy it from me? Okay? I'm better off because they can pay me a ton of money. Okay? They're better off because they live. So we've just described a transaction that makes both parties better off. Why shouldn't that be allowed to happen? So you tell me. Can anyone, does anyone argue, does everyone think eBay was wrong? Yeah, go ahead. Well, in doing so, the other person doesn't have as much money um, also dies, so there's like a third party involved. Okay, so the person, you, you mean the person who, what do you mean the person who doesn't have enough money? There's the opposite somebody who doesn't get the kidney. Right. So, so, on the, so, so in other words, what you're assuming is, let's say that if I hadn't done the auction on eBay, I would have just given my kidney away to the transplant center. Then that's one less kidney that go to the transplant center. And that means the rich guy gets the kidney, and someone else implicitly doesn't. That's a trade-off. Okay, you've just described the trade-off. The trade-off is that basically now we've allocated the kidney away from the poor person to the rich person. Now, but why do we care about that? I mean, they both, it's one, you know, one person dies and the person lives. Why do we care? Yeah? Uh, there might be some sort of case of severity of condition, like there might be someone who's poor who would get the kidney if it went to a transplant um, association because they would die in like, um, a couple of days without it, whereas the rich person might just be able to afford it and it might make their life more convenient, but they might, might not be in any world. They might be a collector. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so basically, th th that's a very so one reason we might care is because uh, is because we think that kidneys should be allocated on the basis of who needs it the most. Okay, so a great example of this, of course, was Mickey Mantle with a liver transplant. Mickey Mantle, famous ball player, raging alcoholic, who uh, had liver failure because he basically was drinking himself to death and jumped the queue and got a liver above above a bunch of lot of people, and then he kept drinking and killed himself and wasted the liver he'd gotten. Okay? So basically, um, you could think that doesn't make sense. We should get the people who need it the most from it to be the most good in terms of increasing their, in terms of increasing their life. Okay? But let's actually, okay, so that's, that's one, that's, that's a good, so we've got the substitution point. Okay? Let's come back to the substitution point, though. Tell me a situation in which that's wrong. Can someone tell me a situation in which, in fact, that's, that's not a valid point? Yeah? Exactly. You were assuming that if a guy didn't sell, he'd give it away. But in fact, if, if it's sell it or keep it, then there's no trade-off. And similar here, it's not like it'll go to, it, 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 if, if it's sell it or keep it, then you might as well let the rich guy get it. Or is there another argument? Is there another reason why you might not want this to happen? Yeah? Maybe you encourage an illegal, like, Yeah, the, the other, so the other reason could be that we 
don't trust people to make good decisions when money's involved. That we think that, gee, if it's really true I can get a couple million bucks for a kidney, I might give mine up even if I haven't really thought through the ramifications of doing so. Even if, I, if there's a risk to the surgery, there's a risk that my other kidney will then fail, then I'll be screwed. Okay? So basically, there, that people might, we might have a paternalistic attitude that will lead us to not want to allow people to engage in this kind of risky behavior. Yeah? And there might also be some legal ramifications associated with that. If someone sells their kidney and then their other kidney fails, they might then blame eBay. What if that? Like that repo movie? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, that's right. There could also be, the, 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 the could, but let, let's leave the lawyers out of this. Okay? I don't like lawyers. We're going to rag on lawyers this semester. We're going to, we're going to leave the lawyers out of this. Um, but, but, but in any case, you're right. That, that, that's sort of a ramification of the same thing. So we've talked about the fact that there's substitution. We've talked about the fact that it's not allocated to those who need it the most. We've talked about the fact that people may be making bad decisions in doing this. But there's another factor as well, which is we may just as a society feel it's unfair that rich people can get things poor people can't. There may be a pure equity component here, okay? which is simply that we as society value equality, value income inequality, and we think people should not have an extra shot at getting a resource just because they're rich. Now, that is a very deep and hard concept. About, and we'll talk about, we'll spend a couple lectures talking about equity towards the end of the semester. By and large, we won't consider it. Okay? But it turns out to be behind much of what we'll discuss okay, in uh, much of what we'll discuss this semester and much of what goes on in economics. Okay? Just take a look at the debate that's going on right now in terms of President Obama trying to decide whether or not to extend tax cuts to wealthy individuals in the US. Okay? Some people argue that allowing those tax cuts would, it would promote the economy. Okay? But others argue it's unfair for rich people to get tax breaks. And that fairness argument matters a lot in terms of driving the kinds of economic policy decisions, the kind of economic decisions we, 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 we uh, need to make. So this semester, we're going to focus a lot on efficiency and optimization and how to get resources from the right to the right place. But you have to remember behind a lot of this is deep normative issues about what should be happening, how should an economy function, and in particular, how should we think about these kind of equity issues that are so, um, uh, that are so important. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about is I want to talk about why micro is not just an abstract concept for things like, you might say, oh, this is all pretty funny, and it's like you know, selling kidneys on eBay, and tax cuts for the rich, and why do I care? Okay? Well, you care because literally every decision you make is made through the kind of framework we're going to think about this semester. Okay? Now, different decisions may follow our models more closely and less closely. But there is not an economic decision, OK? There's not, sorry, let's back up. There's not a decision that people have made the economists haven't tried to model, from whether to produce iPods to how many times to have sex each week, OK? These are all things economists have tried to model with varying degrees of success, OK? And these are, because economists think that these all come from the same decision theoretic framework that we can discuss. Let's talk about a simple example from this course your decision of whether or not to buy the textbook. There's a textbook, and what's, what's it cost? 140 bucks? What's it cost? Anyone know? No, Amazon says 180. What? Amazon says 180, but it's still okay. 130. 130, fine. So 130 bucks for Professor Perloff out at Berkeley. He doesn't get it all. I wrote a textbook, too. He gets a small share of it. OK, so, um, so you have to decide. Now, has anyone bought a used version of the fourth edition? Well, he's the fifth edition now. Has anyone bought a used version of the fourth edition? Does anyone know what the used price is? You can be honest. I don't care. I know some people sell it for like 85 or so. So 85. So you've got to decide. So let's say you can buy the previous edition, the fourth edition for 85, or the current edition for 130. OK? You've got to make that decision. OK? How do you make that decision? Well, you may think, gee, I just make the decision. It's not really about microeconomics, but it is. We're going to model how you think about a decision like that. Well, how do you think about a decision like that? Well, the first thing you consider is your preferences. How much are you willing to take a chance 
that there's new stuff in the fifth edition that you need to know. Okay? If the fifth edition was identical to the fourth edition, then you'd be an idiot to not just buy the used fourth edition. But it's not. Textbook writers are smart, they update their book. Okay? So basically, the fifth edition is updated, there's new things in it. So you have to ask yourself, how, what are the odds that I need some of the new information in the fifth edition relative to the fourth edition? And in thinking about that, you're going to think about your preferences. In particular, are you very risk averse? Are you afraid to take a chance? Or are you risk loving? Are you willing to take a chance? Okay? That's one side of the equation. If you're someone who says, you know, I will not take a chance in life, I just have to make sure I learn the most possible from this course, then you're going to want that new edition. If you're someone who says, you know what, screw it, I'll, just, I'll figure it out later, I'm going to the lectures, I don't care, okay? then you might not want it that much. So that's the first factor. It's going to be your preferences, and particular how much you're willing to take a risk that you need this fifth edition. The second factor is going to be your constraint, how much money you have. Okay? The more money you have, the more you're willing, or more relevant perhaps your parents have, the more willing you are to go ahead and buy that new edition. The less money you have, the less willing you are. Okay? So basically, it's going to depend on whether you're paying or your parents are paying, in which case, what the hell, you might as well buy the fifth edition. Okay? And then finally, you're going to take these preferences and this constraint, your preferences and your resources, and go to the market and look at what does the market tell me the difference is. So you're going to say, here's how much I kind of care about fifth versus fourth edition. Here's the resources I have. Now I'll go to the market and say, aha, there's a uh, $55 difference, a $45 difference between these two editions. So now I will solve that constrained optimization problem. And I will decide whether, uh, whether I want to um, get that book. You might be thinking to yourself, this is stupid. I never think about it that way. But the key point is you don't have to think about it exactly that way. There's a famous example in economics of what's called the as if principle. I don't know if kids still say this one of these, as if. So it's the as if principle. Okay? And basically, it's from Milton Friedman, who's a famous economist from Chicago, who said, look, when you're playing pool, technically you could compute the optimal angles of which to shoot the ball every single time to get the appropriate bounce and get the balls in. You could do the mathematics and compute it. But professional pool players are, are not in this class with you, let me say that. Okay? They're not guys who are able to do that computation. They just know how to hit the ball to get the same outcome they would get if they mathematically solved for the optimal trajectory to hit the ball. Okay? They behave as if they've solved the constrained optimization problem. And your decision when you buy this book, you may not think it through the very framework that I just laid out very heuristically and will lay out more rigorously this semester. But you're going to behave as if you do, because those facts are going to be in your mind. You're going to be thinking about it when you make that decision. So while you may feel the models we learn in this course are rather abstract, don't really uh, explain how you behave on an everyday basis, you're going to behave as if those models are really uh, um, applying to you. And if you think about, over the next few days, think about the decisions you make from, should I bring an umbrella today? It looks like rain. Well, on the one hand, I might lose it. It's a pain to carry. On the other hand, how much do I care about getting wet? That's a constrained optimization decision. To should I have uh, an extra drink at a party Friday night? On the one hand, I might, you know, that could have some pros and cons. Okay? These, are all, these are all decisions, constrained optimization decisions you're going to make. They're going to affect your life. And we'll learn this semester about how you make them and how we model, how economists can use what we learn about that to understand the function of the economy. Okay? So I'm going to stop there. One other announcement. There will almost always, there will in general be handouts every lecture. I'm not going to do PowerPoint, I'm going to do handouts. So when you come in every lecture, please look at the back banister. They'll typically, not today, but typically there'll be handouts uh, that you'll need to follow along with in class. So remember, go to section on Friday. Uh, first problem set will be posted on Friday, and uh, it will be due in section the Friday after. And I'll see you all back here on Monday, uh, next Monday. <laughs>